Cowboys, welcome to Friday. Welcome to What the Truck. I'm Dooner, and that's the dude. Hey, welcome to Freight Alley on this beautiful Friday afternoon. You got your uh, Space Cowboy outfit on, bro. What, Deep what, purple, or what's the, what's the occasion? We're talking about the world's largest rocket ship. Today, oh, yeah. So right. you, you got you to gotta dress up for that. You know, this is a big one today. We're going to get into this really awesome Ukrainian relief project that SECO is doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're going to hear all about that. We'll learn about Best Class. Uh, we're talking to female leader in logistics. And in the main event, as we mentioned, NASA mm. is going to join us to talk about the Artemis launch and the wet dress rehearsal. That they just did. The logistics behind that is amazing. Before we get to all, we got to tip the band and then uh, we'll bring Brian right up. Let's see here. Well, who right we got? On. Looking for a new adventure? Take the next step on your career journey with AIT Worldwide Logistics. When you join their growing team, you'll collaborate with expert colleagues around the world to create innovative solutions backed by world class customer service. If you're ready to push the supply chain envelope, your next adventure is awaiting. Visit the career section at, tell them, dude. Hey, go to AITWorldwide.com, learn more, and apply today immediately after the show. First Let's bring a great man up now. Let's bring a great man up named Brian Patrick Bork. He is the Chief Growth Officer right. at Seco Logistics, and he is involved with a very important project. Brian, thanks for taking a little time out with us today to inform our audience about what you're doing. Absolutely, guys. Thanks for having me. Really excited to talk about this. Yeah, it, you know, it's... Th- it's a time to this. This whole conflict came up in a time where we are still in a supply chain crisis, and it would be very easy for a lot of companies to say, "Yeah, that's going on over there," but look, we we have to worry about our own business. There's enough problems here. But Seco did not go that route. You saw that there needed to be some leadership in this space to help support Ukraine. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, you know, first off, we're we're not uh, we're certainly not the only ones. Uh, we we uh, I, I do want to make mention there are other great organizations out there. Benjamin Gordon from BGSA and Cambridge Capital, Flexport.org, Airlink, which has been an absolutely tremendous organization that we've been supporting through this effort. There are a number of great people and great teams out there. Um, but, uh, you know, we did see at the start of COVID uh, that, you know, we, we do have a unique gift uh, in, in the world. You know, we have a network, we have a supply chain expertise uh, we have in-country expertise. We can move goods across borders. When in in April and in, in May of 2020, when there were so many problems getting PPE to our frontline medical workers, um, we that was really a call to action for us and for our CEO James Gagne, where we're writing checks to procure PPE from uh, folks in China that he had worked with because he was working in China for for 20 years, and and we were working with great organizations like Project Cure to do that. That was that was a wake up call for us. And we recognize that, you know, in in global logistics and freight forwarding, um, we are uniquely qualified and sit at a position where we can add a lot of value to do a lot of good for humanitarian aid and relief. So when unfortunately uh, we did hear about uh, the the invasion and war in in Ukraine, um, we, we, we recognized again that this is another opportunity for us to help out where we can. We did a, a call and announcement out to any organization that we would help to ship items for free uh, up to a, up to a certain point. And uh, we did get a lot of requests uh, and we moved a lot of air freight from the United States. We've moved over 110 pallets thus far. Uh, we've moved uh, five truckloads uh, from the UK uh, into Poland, Ukraine and Moldova. Um, we worked with our agent, uh, Polish forwarding company in Poland and our agent, Delcar in Ukraine. I was on the phone with him this morning uh, doing a lot of deliveries uh, across uh, all of Ukraine, except for, uh, you know, the, the hottest uh, uh, or occupied areas, hottest war zones. Um, we're still making deliveries uh, with them and with a group of volunteers in the hospitaliers organization. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a way that we can help right now out of the United States. We're focused on urgent medical care. So these are things like chest wound kits, first aid kits, bandages, gauze, tourniquets, uh, hospital gowns. These are the items that are getting priority. These are the items that are flying. And again, thanks to great organizations like Airlink, uh, who we were introduced to by United Airlines, one of our freight forwarding airline partners. Uh, they just do some amazing work. They, uh, they, they, got, they got started, in fact, uh, eight years ago or so uh, with the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, and uh, they, they really helped to mobilize in the airline industry 
the best way to support um, the ultimate chaos that happens after a disaster. And, and, and usually air freight rates go up after these disasters. You mentioned disruption. Yes, it's, uh, I, I guess, you know, disruption is the new normal. So what's one new disruption in our operation? Uh, that just seems to be the way that we've been able to respond and, and behave but, uh, and, and, and perform. But, you know, uh, we're, we're focused on helping those organizations like Project Cure, like Airlink, uh, Convoy of Hope, Good for Goods in the UK, um, uh, Crossroads in Scotland, uh, and, and, and really, and the most important thing here is uh, shipping items that are in need, because the last thing we want is to have anything uh, sitting unused in a warehouse in Poland or stuck in transit and not having a destination or a constant need to go to. Yeah, Brian, really we actually, to we were going to ask you that before we get over what, what they need, can, what are some of those things? We wanted to know what, yeah. what you need yeah, in yeah, terms yeah. of donations and supplies and how listeners can help. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll be setting up a uh, a web page here in the next coming days um, to donate directly to Airlink. Um, if anyone wanted to donate directly to Airlink, you can do so today. Um, they uh, what's most powerful about them for those of us in transportation is they're the one. Sometimes they can work with airlines to find available capacity. Maybe there's a flight out of New York, and we find out today that maybe there's some space and we can fit on some humanitarian relief goods. But sometimes they have to pay for charters out in the open market. People do offer discounted rates. They just did a charter, an air charter out of uh, Toronto uh, last week with Air Canada. Uh, they've done, uh, you know, there are other organizations like Flex, Flexport.org that are that are doing charters. Um, it's all about finding that capacity. And then folks like SECO, we come involved because we can do the freight forwarding side. We can do the first mile in the United States. We can do the customs clearance, the last mile uh, in Europe. But Airlink is the key because if charities can find that air transportation um, at a reduced, discounted, or um, uh, subsidized rate, then that means they can give even more. And these are certified charities in the United States. Uh, and we work with our partners, our staff, our agents, um, you know, and sometimes we contract with truckers. And I remember a couple of weeks ago, we had a move of two truckloads going from Missouri to New York. We were talking to our, our branch, Scott Krupp, uh, in St. Louis, and he owns a, a Krupp trucking company is the, the name. And he said, if anyone is trying to make money on these shipments, they should be shot in the neck. You know, he's, he's very passionate. And I think we've seen that across the board. Uh, we have teams in New York, in Philadelphia, that are uh, giving their hours over the weekend, that are helping to restack pallets to get ready for air freight. You can't go above 60 inches. There are things that are arriving in Poland that uh, were supposed to be 20 pallets, they're 26, so we have to redo T1 documents. There's in all of this flurry and chaos, mm -hmm. things happen, and, and our teams have responded. The trucking community has responded. The airline community has responded. Uh, the logistics community has responded. We have people giving their time for free. Uh, we have people donating their, their trucks, paying for their own fuel to get these goods to the airports in the United States as fast as possible to make flights uh, and getting from places like Poland into Ukraine working with hospitaliers. These are, it's a voluntary driven organization to support the medical brigade and doctors. This is relief going directly to doctors on the front line, supporting civilians, uh, troops uh, on both sides, by the way. And uh, because that's the way the Ukrainian people are, um, they're there to help anyone in need, uh, uh, whether it's urgent or not. So it's, uh, it's been absolutely incredible, the community and how they've responded. Well, Brian, before we let you go, do you have a plea to anyone in the logistics community or business community who's thinking of getting involved with something like this but have not yet? Uh, absolutely. You can uh, contact us at SecoCares at SecoLogistics.com. If you uh, have a, a truck and you want to offer your services um, and if you have money uh, and you'd like to donate, donate directly to Airlink. Uh, they, they're the best organization right now that can make the most impact at least in the United States. And there's a lot of other great organizations like Red Cross that are doing great things and Doctors Without Borders, of course, um, that uh, we're doing deliveries to um, a lot of great organizations on the ground already. Right now, a lot of them need financial assistance more than they need things like you know, coats and diapers. So uh, money is really important right now for these organizations. But there's going to be a longer term issue with a lot of people that are displaced. So this is unfortunately going to be long term. But right now we're focused on the immediate and the urgent. Mm. Brian, thank you so much. You're doing the Lord's work out there. Thanks for sharing Amen. that with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck with this project. Thank you, guys. And uh, as our team in Ukraine say, Slava Ukraina.
Love it. Here you go. A little cowbell for that one, brother. Slavo Ukraine. That, yeah, it's tremendous stuff. And I'm glad he mentioned that air link and that general people like y- you and myself, we're not going to be able to, you know, donate coats and, and medical yeah. supplies and have any effect, but we can give some money to air link yeah. to help us just spread with awareness, those costs right? to make that happen and awareness. Oh, yeah, right? we can let the leaders in logistics who watch this show know what's going on so they want to get involved. Amen. Speaking of leaders in logistics, one of the leaders behind the truck in this business is Ingrid Brown. She's the FMCSA voice of safety. She's over at Matt's right now, and she has a brand new show show on Freight Waves TV, and soon it'll be on our brand new site, Back the Truck Up. She's Ooh. joining our awesome talent pool. By the way, talk about Talent Emporium. Yesterday, hired Rachel Premack from Business Insider. Yeah, right? Today, hired two gentlemen that are coming on to the Back the Truck Up team. Nice. Talent Emporium over here. But let's take a quick look at Ingrid Brown's sizzle reel for her show, America on 18 Wheels. Good morning. Welcome to America on 18 Wheels. I'm Ingrid Brown. These are things that you need on the truck. Pick the phone up. Call a friend. Better yet, call your mama. In inclement weather and in road shutdowns and wrecks and times that we're out here in the winter, we got to have our phone. We all have a fluorescent safety vest. You don't? Shame on you. You need to go buy one. I think I need to go to work. (laughs) Have a great day. Love it. Ingrid is uh, the best. And she teaches us where to pick the best roller dogs from, too. And how to do it. And how to do it. Because there's a technique. Speaking of ladies who are leaders in logistics, Jill Rice is here with us. She's a partner at Port X Logistics. And she's going to talk a little bit about that today as well with us. Jill, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, where are you? Where are you hanging out right now? What part of the world are you? Um, we're I'm in our main office in Buffalo, so not not the greatest of weather, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to hide in the closet because it's so loud here today. Lots of energy. Well, love the energy. Love the energy. We bring a lot here, too. So we're looking forward to this. But let's crack into this. So on LinkedIn, you posted, women in logistics No, we don't always have it so easy, but we love it and we work hard. I never imagined my wildest dreams that I would be a part of such an amazing team of women. Tell us a little bit about that journey. So I actually started in this industry in 1998. Um, I was in college at the time. No idea what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted a full time job. Uh, my uncle used to deliver to this warehouse that was looking for help constantly. Um, it was a consolidated freight station um, that we just uh, did a lot of deliveries up to Canada. So I was like, okay, give it a try. I'm young enough. I can move around the, the warehouse, whatever. Um, so I started there loading, unloading trucks, uh, putting together cross cross border paperwork, just really trying to learn as much as I could. Um, but it did get really interesting to me in that there was a lot of turnaround in um, the customers that I dealt with, the uh, just everybody in the network that I dealt with was just like jumping. Nobody wanted to deal with the hustle and bustle of the logistics. I mean, this is back in 1998. They haven't even seen what the past two years were like. Um, so I was like, I really enjoy this. Why do people keep leaving? And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take advantage of everybody leaving and learn as much as I can. So um, I just learned a lot as I went, got more promotions, um, left there to be a returns manager at another container freight station, um, just kept building my network of people. Um, I did a, I went to UPS Freight as the, uh, the operations person, third shift, learned some stuff there, um, left there and got into third party logistics and, uh, you know, worked at the place that we were before we opened Portex and worked in the pricing department, learned as much as I could and met our the team of uh, leaders and owners that we are, we have here at Portex and built what we could here. We just wanted something different. We wanted something awesome. And we wanted to kind of push our expertise onto people that we knew we could build an awesome team. And we definitely have. Um, there, you know, there's not, not much I can say. We actually are yeah. now more females. We have more females at Portex than males. So that is, that's a pretty big accomplishment. But, awesome. 
so Jill, let's talk about that a little bit. What you, so you've been in the business since 1998. What has changed and what does it mean to be a female leader now in 2022 as opposed to then? So really back then, it just wasn't, I don't think it was an industry that a lot of females were really interested in. Um, you know, it's a more, it, it's more of a get your hands dirty kind of job, whether it's warehousing, truck driving, um, even being a, a manager on a board in uh, an industry that really was male dominated, especially back then. Um, you know, it, it was, it was real different. It wasn't that long ago, but in like in reality to compare to now, it really seemed like it was a long time away. Well, let's talk about now. Um, what does it mean now, to be a female leader now? Yeah. Now you just see so much more females that want to be a part of the operations and um, growing a business and really wanting to get their hands dirty and learn as much as possible. And um, really, I, as far as what I see, our girls here are incredible. You know, they have a ton of um, skills that they want, that they had set for themselves that really pertain to the logistics business. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, they really just love what they do. And we're always here to help back them up, but they just, right. they, they're just awesome. So Jill, Jill, let me ask you, let me ask you this. What were some of the biggest challenges or the biggest challenges or, or adversity that you overcame, right? You talked about how this business is, and, and what I like in it too, and what you said is you can't come into this business and just kind of get by, right? It, it doesn't work that way. You've got to be one of those people that wants to get involved and enjoy that challenge all the time. Was the adversity learning all that or maybe somebody believing that a female wanted to and could get that done in what was predominantly a male dominated business before? It's a lot of self reflection, <laughs> really yeah. just being tough you know, kind of being tough in your own sense and kind of standing the ground and knowing that you can do this, you know, male or female, just put that aside. Don't think about it and put yourself on a, the same level as everybody else um, and really just learn as much as you can. Sure. How about giving back, though? How about the the youth of America, young girls in college thinking about joining this field? What, what kind of advice would you give to them if they're considering a job in logistics? Definitely um, stay humble, but take on every task that is that you can. Take on every task that you can take on, but stay humble. Um, learn, be an expert, take risks, and learn from all your mistakes, definitely. Um, ask a lot of questions. Uh, build your network. Uh, learn and be an expert, take, take risks, and really learn from your mistakes. Uh, but really be fearless. The saying, fake it till you make it, it that's all about logistics. <laughs> you know, you can really just, it really is, logistics is fake it till you make it. It, it um, is one of those, you're right, it's one of those industries where you've got to just say, yeah, I can do that and then go figure it out, right? right. You, you, you've got I to mean, jump The past two years is a complete reflection of of that. You know, you just got to say to yourself, I got this, we got this, we'll help you out. We'll get it done. Um, and well, then, Jill, I'm you know, sure there's, there's plenty of women out there that they feel heard now, right? Uh, You're mm -hmm. in, in talking about your journey. If they want to work with a strong female team, like you mentioned at Port X, where do we send them to? Um, we actually have a careers tab on our Port X logistics.com website. Um, we're always hiring and we have multiple offices and we're con continuing to grow. Um, but we're hiring always go to the careers tab at fordexlogistics.com. Jill, thank you much. Thank you very much. Say hi to BK for us and have a great weekend. <laughs> I will. Right, for sure. Care. Thanks. Take care. You know what I hate? Michael Vincent. Um, going through the tolls and getting a citation. That's what I hate. Yeah, that is <laughs> annoying, isn't it? It sure is. Especially when you're in a place and you don't know there's a toll and you just blow through it. Oh, right? yeah. Or sometimes you don't even know the cameras are like hidden there. You yeah, think you're being slick. You think you're going to make it through like the other camera. end and then something comes in the mail. Well, I like that camera. we know a guy who's fighting citations and tolls and dealing with all of that headache for that, you. It's Tom right. Fogarty. He's a CEO at Best Pass and he's sitting right here right now. How are you, Tom? Great, guys. Thanks for having me on. And, and you're, you're spot on in terms of uh, we're in the business of solving headaches for our clients. So um, 
it uh, it usually feels good. Client feedback is fantastic, uh, and love to help you out with your challenges as well. Well, we there love it, go. Tom. Tom, give us like, the elevator pitch on Best Pass just for the uninitiated, and also where are you sitting right now? Where are you hanging out? Um, just outside of uh, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, uh, at the moment. So, Ooh, um, okay, is that an Iron Man mask behind you? <laughs> there are a couple of uh, deal toys from my last business. So, oh, I love uh, you know, the days of investment banks giving you a little plastic uh, token for your table are, are a little bit over. We like to have a lot of fun. Uh, they discovered I'm a, an Iron Man fan. And uh, so there's an Iron Man mask and there's a uh, infinity gauntlet um, from the couple deals that uh, we've gotten done in the past. Nice. nice. Yeah, so cool. You're like it's Thanos. You snap your fingers and deal with these citations, right? That's right. That's right. Now my infinity gauntlet, um, the fingers actually move and can be put in different positions. And I'll let you guess what my kids like to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can guess what they yeah, back to. Thoughts. So give us the elevator pitch, uh, pitch on, on, on Best Pass. Yeah. So Best Pass, we believe in simplifying the complex for our clients. And the way we do it is with toll management services. So we have a nationwide network of uh, interfaces with all the tolling authorities that our fleet's customers need. Uh, and we make it so that they've got one kind of central management uh, through our software, uh, one point of contact for any problems that come up. And we just keep expanding the solution to solve more and more of that headache. So what is the scope of toll violations, especially in, in 2022? I haven't really looked at those numbers. How many of your drivers are getting and how big of a problem is it? How big is that headache? Yeah, so we had a fun experience and I don't know that they'll let me uh, use the name, but uh, the largest retailer. Uh, we went down to visit them on a sales call about uh, two years ago um, and they had a warehouse with <laughs> boxes and boxes of violations uh, because they weren't matching the right level of information to their vehicles, to their transponders, uh, and they just wanted the problem to, to go away. Uh, and using Best Passes toll management, uh, we're able to do that. I think the surveys that we've done sh that we've done show a ninety five percent reduction in violations. So uh, we feel pretty good about that, and our customers feel like a uh, a lot of frustration has been uh, let out of the balloon. Yeah, so Tom, you've got a new product to deal with these these citations and dealing. With. What is it? Can you dig into it a little bit? How exactly does it work? Yeah, sure. So we've been throughout our history and we were founded 20 years ago as a member services offering and uh, linked into the last segment. Proud to say that Heather Nolan, uh, who was in charge of that effort within the Trucking Association in New York, is uh, still one of our executives, still with the business, still contributing as the, the leading um, brain within toll management. And so um, we've always been focused on toll management, expanded throughout the country, made it simple for our clients to use it and focused on minimizing toll violations as well as paying the tolls themselves, uh, getting back the information to our clients to be able to support uh, you know, near real-time billing and those sorts of things. So we've just expanded now into cit uh, citations. So you've seen a lot of cameras springing up uh, with you know, speed cameras, red light cameras, all types of things that make it a lot more difficult on, uh, on the drivers in an already tough environment. Uh, we kind of simplify that and the new offering that my marketing folks might be a little bit upset if I talk too much about it because the press release goes out in about a week and a half uh, is on cit citations management. So it's not only toll violations, but any type of violations that our uh, customers incur with their drivers and their vehicles, uh, we're ready to help process them and make it easy. You know, I think when we think about 50 different tolling authorities, and the challenges of dealing with them. When you get into citations, you're looking at uh, over 4,000 in the US government authorities or quasi-government uh, agencies that need to be dealt with in managing citations. And, and that's what I'm excited to announce that we're here for our clients uh, starting next month, launching next month, actually. What do you what do you wish people knew more about citations? Are there, are there misconceptions out there or are they making big mistakes around these things? Yeah, on the and, and I'll divide them into two. I know it's a nuance. So a citation is essentially a ticket, um, and violations are when you go through the toll without paying it, or the the uh, toll gantry doesn't pick up your uh, your the right information, and you end up getting a bill and a penalty in the mail. Um, on the on the violations, that's an easy part, right? Because by properly registering the vehicle, the transponder technology, the license plates, uh, you can make them disappear. 
Uh, we've also got the ability through our technology to be able to um, sense travel patterns amongst our customers. So that if somebody's billed because there was a, a misread of a transponder for the entire length of the Pennsylvania Turnpike, as an example, and we know that the warehouse is by Allentown uh, and they bring it to uh, the uh, uh, Philadelphia airport, you know, that's a lot shorter route. And we're able to identify that past track traffic pattern and have the trust, trusted relationship with the tolling authorities that we can put through uh, an instantaneous credit uh, to be a uh, request to be granted. So um, that's very, very helpful and takes all of the boxes away in terms of processing and managing and creating separate payments. On the citations uh, front, we see the same thing. And we've been running in pilot mode with several of our 20,000 customers uh, over the last four months to make sure that we understand all the challenges and that the solution is primed, ready to go, and as tech enabled as possible uh, to move it forward. So as you can imagine, the challenges there are receiving the information, uh, letters in the mail. When you get into proper citations, like again, essentially tickets, that's where there's liability that goes far beyond uh, just not paying a toll. So uh, you can end up with license suspended, vehicles uh, seized, and all those kinds of things. And so it's it's a very delicate matter. Uh, besides the complexity, you got to get it done right, and that's where we come in. Yeah, it does. So uh, a lot of this is is uh, auditing and making sure things are fixed after the fact. Do you do you work on a preventative side as well? And can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So uh, right when we take on um, large fleets, and I mentioned we have twenty thousand customers, we've got. I believe it's 70 of the top 100 fleets uh, in the country as, as customers of, of Best Pass. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank them for their business and their trust in us as a partner. Um, but as we do an onboarding for a new client, we get all that information. We, we, we will ship out a transponder where that's required. We will link it to the vehicle, to the license plate. We've got online tools that make it easy for our clients to make changes and maintain it up to date. And so once that database is current and up to date, violations should disappear. Uh, citations, we also look forward to uh, being minimized after we launch. Um, obviously, if somebody's caught speeding or going through a red light, we can't reverse that. Uh, it's not quite as simple as making sure the right information's on right. file, uh, but we can make sure it gets processed timely so that there's no penalties, there's no further liability associated with it. Okay, so you're not going to pay my traffic ticket for me outright, though. <laughs> okay, well, that's <laughs> no, that's fine though. But you know, there's you a lot of blind. Actually. How about there, bail? <laughs> there's a lot of blind spots that that come with this stuff. But what what are some other ways that you help customers reconcile these these toll violations? Um, yeah, so we we've got within the software itself, we've got the ability to do things far beyond what our toll authority partners can do. So you can essentially create an accounting ledger so that the right vehicles are in the right department or build to the right customer and those kinds of things. So by by simplifying that and have that all being managed by the software with the you know properly setting it up in the first place, and then it's it's a dream to go forward um, and and manage. So the the important thing is dealing with it minimizing it. Uh, and then to the extent you're able to um, build that into your cost estimates and things like that, making sure that you're properly uh, billing it on to the folks that are asking you to do them the service of moving their goods around. Yeah. So Tom, um, it, it sounds to me like a lot of this is very, very, very important, as you alluded to before, that this, you know, goes from a citation or a bill that you missed, right? And it can go to suspensions of license and hitting your insurance, et cetera. And so you're really kind of not only handling those, and they're, they're not, I want to call them trivial, but it can grow to something where you're actually providing that information that's going to help somebody in a legal matter as well, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and we should be able to have that audit tracking. We, we will be coming out in the uh, not too distant future. Uh, with some GPS, you know, relying on the GPS uh, tracking data that our customers have and being able to plot to uh, apply that to verifiable patterns. And, and were you there? Were you not there? Um, and auto disputing uh, when there's errors made by any of the authorities that are issuing the citations or the violations. So, um, yeah, it's one of those things that it, it really is a pleasure to talk to our customers and and might be the first business I've been associated with that that's true 100 percent of the time. Uh, because those that before remember the days before Best Pass and then the simplification and almost these types of services becoming an, ap an afterthought, going from a nightmare and a headache to a an afterthought so that they can go get on with the pressing um, 
issues that they're dealing with in terms of driver, driver shortages, vehicle shortages, maintenance, uh, all those complex things that probably tolling and violations rivals it in terms of the complexity. But but all of a sudden it's simple and it's managed for them. And uh, it, it really is a pleasure to lead the team that's delivering that service. Well, Tom, hey, great stuff. So if people are interested in working with you <clears throat> and working with BestPass, where should we send them to? Yeah, they should either go to uh, the website at bestpass.com uh, or feel free to reach out with to me directly at uh, tfogarty uh, at bestpass.com. And Tom, before we let you go, the most important question in this interview, what is your favorite Marvel movie? <laughs> very, very important, actually. I love, love Iron Man. Uh, Just the original the classic, one. The recent, yes, yes, for the original sure. One. Solid uh, choice. And you, there you go. <laughs> I, I love Iron Man myself, man. I mean, dude, I, I Stark, liked Endgame. Tony you know, Stark. I liked I liked the last the Infinity Wars Endgame trilogy. Oh, okay. It brought it all together. It brought it all mm-hmm. home. I also have a huge soft spot for the new Spider Man too, oh. just because they brought all three generations together. Okay. I don't know. I haven't Have caught it yet, but I will. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Thanks for coming on the show today. Sweet. Thanks, guys. See Take you soon. Care. All right. Did you know Forbes just named AIT Worldwide Logistics as one of America's best? Mid-sized employers for 2022. In fact, AIT is the number one employer in the transportation and logistics category. Did you know that? I, I did. Boost Absolutely. your job satisfaction, regain a sense of purpose. I know you need one. And open your career opportunities <laughs> to one of the fastest growing organizations in the industry. Visit careers on, tell them, dude. Hey, go to AITWorldwide.com to learn more and apply today. And you're absolutely right. I do need a sense of purpose at times. Hey, so there's a lot of buzz (laughs) going on around here at Freight Waves about the future of supply chain. And I love that in-person events are back because all the energy fills up in this building. Now, virtual events are fine, but you can't replace that flesh and blood experience. Can you, Michael Vincent? You, you absolutely cannot to experience, as we did last week, a little bit of taste of that carpeting at, in the conference rooms, right? I think we have a little preview, yeah. too, of the, uh, the event, if you want to roll oh, that one. we do. All right. Any sound on this thing? No, I guess not. Well, I this is taking not. place May 9th that. to 10th, taking logistics to the next level, May 9th to 10th, 2022, at the Rogers Convention Center. In-person events are back. Freight Waves is shaking up the industry. There's going to be like 50 demos at this thing. Those rapid-fire demos. Can't Those hide behind awesome. the virtual walls or sneaky edits or anything. you got to do this live and in-person and face the music from the audience. Right. We're going to have the What the Truck live stage here. It's going to be massive, right? We're going to have the Freight Waves TV stage. This is a talent emporium. Now, there's so many people here in the house that are going to be there. All your favorite Freight Waves TV people, all your speakers. And then we have these amazing keynotes. We have Asia Hutchinson, state of Arkansas. He's the governor over there. We got Billy Bean from the Oakland A's, EVP of Baseball Operations. Talks at Moneyball, right? We got Jonathan Hoffman from the Pentagon. We got... Uh, Michael Schrang, he's the MIT Sloan School Initiative. Who's got the uh, industry keynote? We got Gudam Narang, he's from Gatech. And then, geez, we got so many other. Oh, yeah, Benjamin Gordon, he was mentioned earlier in this show. Yeah, absolutely. George Borowski from Chep is going to be there. We've got people from Nestle. Who? Jo- Greg Kesson. Greg Kesson. Yep, absolutely. And it, so, yeah, it's going to be awesome there. And networking and face to face, right? We haven't done that in so long. My last one was Modex, dude. Really? Yeah, my yeah. last one was uh, Air Cargo Club 2020 in January of 2020. That's where we ran into uh, That's where we ran into NASA, s- and that's, that's right. when the NASA relationship started. We are waiting for them to, to join us, so let's jump to a little good news, bad news, and then we'll get over to that. Uh, bad news and good news. Yeah. Oh, they're okay. All right. Yeah, oh, by the way, go to live.freightwaves.com, right, and get those tickets, twelve ninety five. dollars Twelve ninety five through March Madness. Until March Madness ends. Right. Unless, you know, you have my bracket, then it's already over. <laughs> All right, here it is. Bad news, right? One early November morning in 2020, you're on surface streets by the FedEx hub. It's 3 a.m. in the morning mm. near Nashville, and mm. you crash into a power pole. Mm, Your car good. bursts into flames, and you and another occupant are trapped inside. To make matters worse, other vehicles pull up and start watching, taking pictures, but not getting out to help. Good what? news. Good news. Good news. Uh, trucker Christopher Lloyd, and he ain't other vehicles. He's a freaking hero. Lloyd rushed out of his cab, uh, l- rushed out of his cab, ran over to um, the car over there. He called 911. He broke out his fire extinguisher, started breaking windows. Initially, his fire extinguisher was not able to pull out the blaze. Uh, he tried to pull the doors open, but they were locked. This was a nightmare. So he says, I ran back to my truck for a winch bar and my 10-pound hazmat extinguisher 
to finish putting the fire out and to bust out the windows. Uh, wow. The driver, he says, was pinned behind the wheel but still breathing, so he knew that they were alive. The male passenger had been thrown into the back seat. He was in pretty bad shape. He said he checked, and he found a pulse, He was and he was breathing. He ended up saving those two from burning to death, Michael Vincent. That's unbelievable. What a hero. For his heroics, Lloyd has been named the TCA 2021 Highway Angel of the Year. He was honored at TCA's Truckload 2022 Las Vegas Conference in Las Vegas this week. Lloyd will receive a... Epi, Epic View satellite TV package it includes a 24-inch flat-screen TV. I imagine it's that small because of a truck, right? You can't just put like a yeah, 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 yeah. TV put it in Yeah, it's a satellite TV for his yeah. truck. Excellent stuff. He gets a DVI with a one-year subscription to uh, over 100 channels of direct TV programming, and he's got HBO Cinemax, Showtime, NFL Sunday Ticket. By the way, buddy, if you got HBO Max, Space Ghost, all the old episodes, Space Ghost Coast to Coast yeah, check is on there. there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they got their life. He got a TV. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. Great guy. I've got some got? bad news for you, too, as what well. What is it? Western Dental messed up your mouth, bro. Uh, not they, again. They went in there and they screwed it up. Not again. <laughs> is it the second that you keep going back for this? <laughs> well, I tried Aspen first, but they were just as bad. <laughs> oh, were they really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't know, man. But here's the good news, brother. You've got a guitar, and you know how to use it. Oh. Yeah. Check this guy out right here. Right? So what is he doing? I want to hear it. Listen to me. He's killing it. So he's out front. This is in Merced, California. So this dude goes to Western Western, uh, Dental uh, Orthodontics. They screw up his mouth. He comes out, sets up his Fender amp, pulls out his guitar. He's got a tremolo bar on, and the guy can play, dude. He's got a sign. Western Dental sucks. He's totally just, he's he's out there getting it. Lane Barton is the guy's name. And, and he's out there. He said, I went there, Google reviews for these guys said, hey, they're pretty good. They help people, stuff like that. I want yeah. to try them out. Not so good. No, you know what? A lot of people pay for those Google reviews, and they also pay to suppress other reviews. So don't, never trust those things. I but tell you what, I might pay money to hear him protest. I got, a Google re- I got my own Google review of his sign, though. Next time, sir, you want to make a protest sign, use thicker markers. It's hard, it's hard to read. It's not really as legible from, uh, from across the street. You got it big and thick. People really understand that Western Dental sucks. They'll really get your message. But dude, I'm, I'm telling you, try and, and hit that, grab the sustain, get that tremolo bar going, and pull up that sign all at the same time. This guy's got talent, man. He should be on stage somewhere is what should be going on. And I, I, will, uh, I will look for him and uh, follow him and find out where he's going to protest next because the dude's got talent. You Love it. Okay, NASA is almost on their way. Let's get to another good news, bad news okay, before let's do it. we do, though. Right on. Delay on the launch pad, is there not? <laughs> what do we got? Oh, I hear bad news. An autonomous truck has taken your job, right? Oh, Finally, yeah. Finally, <laughs> it took your job. There's not really any like electric autonomous trucks going over the road yet. They haven't taken your jobs yet. Don't worry yet. Not but yet. Let's say for the premise of this little segment, an autonomous truck has taken your job. But the good news is you now got an office job. You get a cushy little office job. Yeah. But the bad news is you've got a hard time adjusting. Check out this video from TikToking Trucker and one time what the truck guest, Chase Barber. All right. One of the big problems with self-driving trucks that nobody seems to be talking about is the fact that if it does put truckers out of work, truckers are going to have to end up working at the office with the office people. And I just want you to picture for a second how truckers are going to do at the office. What do you mean these aren't appropriate office clothes? I'm in an office and these are clothes, therefore they're office clothes. Now, trust me, it's way more comfortable to work with your seat slammed all the way to the floor and then a high extension on your mouse. It's just more comfortable. People that ride with their office chairs all the way up are just new to mouse pushing. Yeah, I know I can't see the top half of the screen with this drop visor on, but a real mouse pusher shouldn't have to. He should know what's up there and where his mouse is. Besides, if you really need to see it, sometimes you can just lean down. I mean, yeah, of course I got lights all over my rig. I got lights on the keyboard, we got lights on the computer, lights on the mouse, lights on my blue parrot. You gotta have the lights. You don't need the lights, but you need the lights. Know what I mean? I tell you, no boss or HR person's telling me how I push my mouse. I've been pushing mouse for 15 years. My dad pushed mouse and my granddad pushed mouse. I was pushing a mouse and had a computer before I learned how to walk. I am the captain of my computer, and what I say goes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I just hired a couple of triggers. I, I hope, uh, and, and you know, they're getting out from behind the cab. I hope that their uh, their reaction is similar. I like the energy out of Chase. We got to get him back on the show. By I, the way, I tell you what, I've never been a truck driver. I've, uh, you know, I've worked on docks and stuff like that, and now I'm an office guy and have been for quite some time. I would welcome him to sit next to me and have a great time with that trucker right next to me. Now, did, so did you have any trouble like taking that edge off and transitioning from? 
uh, like the doc work to being on like the more corporate office side? I would say that there are many people who know me right now who would argue and say that I never have lost that so. edge. It's still difficult getting rid of it. Well, yeah, no, I so think it's in your blood, man. You know, I, not everybody knows your background, but part of it is that you worked in a prison for a while as well, That's right. right? That's absolutely true. Well, yeah. they're not going to learn any more about it because NASA's here, so we'll get to that on another <laughs> That's day. That's a teaser for another That's show. That's a teaser right for there. another day is life over in prison. Uh, let's forget about that whole thing no, and got, move to we NASA. We got a deal, but well, actually, hold on. We have a really intro. Let's look, let's look at this intro video on Artemis first, then we'll jump right over to him. Yeah, yeah. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible, with science fiction turned reality, with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. Let's go to the moon and let's, let's talk to a it. gentleman who I think is working in his dream job. It is Abdel Santos Galando. He's a ground systems integration engineer for exploration ground systems at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure being here with you guys. That video was amazing. It really is. You know, NASA, as long as I can remember, as long as I, I've known about NASA as a child, they made a great point in that video, and it said how it inspires our young and inspires the future and inspires those new ideas. And you, I think, are, I was looking at your background. You've been there since you were an intern. I think you're almost a living example of what that was talking about. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I've had the chance of being here, like you said, since I was an intern. I was actually here in the last space shuttle launch mission. I'm actually sitting right now inside of our mission control room. So literally in this same place when the last space shuttle took off in 2011 and just being here again for the Artemis mission is just inspiring, incredibly amazing. Yeah, so you were you were actually you worked at, at Disney at, at one point running uh, monorails, working with the mon monorail system there as well, paying your way through college so you could become part of NASA. Uh, what What's harder? What was harder? Is it NASA or Disney? So it's really interesting that you mentioned that. I, I try to tell everybody, you know, here at NASA, we work with a lot of people that are like very understanding, knowledgeable of every single little step that we're taking and we're doing. Over at Disney, we're kind of working with people that don't necessarily know what to expect and they're on vacation. So you kind of have to guide them around to get to where they need to go. So I think sometimes Disney is a little bit harder, if I were to be honest. <laughs> I, was, I was just there with my family. And the logistics that go into Disney is just, it's, it's almost mind-blowing, the operation that, that goes on there. Uh, you guys have like a launch every week. They have a launch like every single second of the day when, when they have their doors open. Let's talk about that. So the video, the video kind of let us know a little bit about what's going on with Artemis, right? It's, it's a mission back to the moon. And it mentioned a lunar economy and some of the inspiration. But why, are, why do you enjoy being on this team? Why do you think we should go back to the moon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's time for us to explore the moon again. I mean, we definitely went there many, many years ago. And when we went, we didn't actually stay. We kind of just went, visited, picked up a couple of things and called it a day. So now it's time for us to actually be able to go there and have people stay in that in that area and learn about how to live in another body so that what eventually can go on to the Mars and so on and so forth. So it's kind of like a stepping stone in the right direction to making humans an interplanetary species. That's yeah, an excellent answer. But Ab Abadel, what, what is the lunar economy? I've not heard lunar economy till today. 
Yeah. So essentially, it's like an opportunity for us to be able to take resources that are on the moon right now and utilize them not only to start a economy or a process for us to have vehicles launching and operating from the moon, but also maybe even have the capability to bring some of that stuff back here to Earth and utilize it to furnish our energy, our technology, et cetera, to make our world a better place. You're not, uh, you're not just playing around with anything, though. You're playing around with your most powerful rocket ever. You just started rolling this thing out for a wet dress rehearsal. We have some footage we can roll in the background. Tell, tell us a little bit about what's, what we're looking at here and what was going on, like what a wet dress rehearsal is for a rocket. Absolutely. So essentially, it's the last chance that we have to basically test the rocket to get it ready to go and fuel it up just up until the last possible second that we can and make sure that everything works appropriately. So right here in Mission Control, where I am right now, we essentially test all of our equipment, make sure that everything is ready to operate appropriately. And in just a few seconds before we actually hit that launch button, we stopped and we say, we're good. Everything worked appropriately. Let's go ahead and do some final checkups and systems, and then we'll go ahead and we'll send that rocket off to the moon. So it took a lot of years and a lot of many years of, of experienced people working on this to get to where we are today, and we're amazingly excited for it. Yeah, so Abadel, tell us about this rocket. It is absolutely massive, the biggest or one of the biggest, if not the, the biggest. I believe it is the biggest and most powerful. Can you give us some information on this rocket? Absolutely, yeah. So it's a 320 feet tall rocket. It essentially has 15% more power, more thrust than the Saturn V used to have. And the coolest thing about it all is that this is only version one of the rocket. So we actually have some other ones that are being worked on right now called Block 1B and Block B, which are even going to be more powerful. And we'll have essentially the capability to send astronauts and their cargoes to the moon and then set up all the different kinds of systems and equipments up there. So this is only the beginning, if anything. Now, those listeners who have followed all of our NASA segments on here, we've done the VAB before, and I know you work out of there. In terms of this project, what goes down in the VAB? What are you doing? A lot of logistical work, I'll tell you that. So essentially, we basically have an opportunity to say to ourselves, we have this massive Lego set that comes with instructions and has a bunch of pieces being shipped from all across the country. And in the VAB, we got to put it together, test it make sure that it works properly, and then get it ready to roll out of the pad. So myself and my team, we're essentially in charge of certifying all the ground support equipment that interacts with the vehicle. So we're talking about the platforms, we're talking about the fire suppression system, cranes, elevators, literally everything that you see around that building, we certify to make sure that it's ready to be used for the equipment. And essentially then the rest of the technicians and engineering team can put it to use so that they can assemble that rocket. And that's just one small part of everything that goes around there. So you've got to go through and check every nut and bolt as it's being put together and certify that everything is going to work there. Talk to me about this crawler transport. That looks like it could be fun or incredibly boring to drive, right? <laughs> ten and a half hours or something like that, or close to ten and a half hours to go four miles, right? Talk to us about that. How, how wild is that? Yeah, absolutely. So first thing that I would say about the crawler is pretty much to everybody's eyes, it is the same crawler that we utilized during the Apollo program to carry the Saturn V. Same crawler we utilized during the shuttle program to carry more than 100 missions into the to, for the space shuttle, and the same one that we're using right now. And so this be, massive vehicle weighs 6.6 .6 million pounds and can transport 80 million pounds, which is essentially the same weight of more than 20 full load at seven seven airplanes. And it also travels at a whopping top speed of 0.8 miles per hour, which I don't even think we went that fast the first time we were rolling the rocket because we're trying to be careful. You know, we don't want that toppling over. It might be for a bad day. <laughs> You're not going to hammer down. So, <laughs> exactly. I mean, the, we covered the crawler, too. The crawler, to transport. I was looking at this thing. It took it 10 and a half hours to go four miles. It's, dry, it's like driving through downtown Atlanta, right? <laughs> You're, just stuck for, You're just stuck forever on the road. Um, uh, what it goes into that aspect of it, just getting it from there. I mean, you're not talking about moving a, moving a 53 foot container. You're talking, I mean, how much does that thing weigh by the way? Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, the crawler itself weighs 6.6 .6 million pounds and essentially everything starts months in advance to be able to get everything ready to go. Check that the systems are operating properly, do some routine preventative maintenance checks, operate the vehicle to get it ready to go right in front of the platform itself to be able to then open the doors for the BAB get it in position, which you're kind of seeing a video of it rolling out of the pad. And once we have all that, this behemoth leads to literally lift up and pick up that entire rocket stack from the position in the BAB and then say that it's ready to go. So many, many days in advance, we started doing all this work for this rollout for the vehicle. And it just takes an endless amount of hours, work, time, 
and effort from everybody to get to that specific point where we can say we're ready to roll it out of the building. Hey, so you're doing this wet dressers, and if I understand correctly, the Artemis One launch will not have humans in it. Why no humans for the first launch? Absolutely. So essentially, it is the first mission that we have where we have a SLS rocket with an Orion capsule kind of put together with all of our ground support equipment at Exploration Ground Systems Program, which is where I work. And what we do is that we want to make sure that everything operates smoothly and appropriately before we get humans on board. So, you know, at NASA, safety is our priority. So we're trying to ensure that everything is ready to rock and roll and get everybody over to the moon before we actually put people on board for it. But that being said, once we have the Artemis II mission coming up here in a couple of years, there will be humans on board. And this will be the first time in many years that we'll have people traveling to the moon and getting all this amazing Artemis mission started. You know, Abadel, you said uh, sometimes science and engineering need a little magic to make it happen. Uh, can you give us a little insight into that? Why is NASA so magical? I mean, everybody we talk to is just so into it and so awesome. Uh, yeah. What What's the secret sauce? I mean, you can't hide the attitude of, of no, NASA workers you can't. when you talk to them. They're, you're always so enthusiastic. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I think the most important thing out of everything is, you know, being a part of this group, you have to have the inspiration and the idea to think outside of the box and work on all these incredible things that many years ago, you probably didn't even think that they were a real thing. So in reality, you know, when you think about it from that perspective, it's like you're putting a little bit of magic into making it a reality and making it happen, which is what we do at NASA literally every single day. I mean, Artemis is definitely the main program that we have right now, but there's countless amount of work going on all throughout the agency that is just doing incredible things that if you were to ask me a couple of years ago, I would be like, there's no way we could do that. And we're doing it today. Are you hitting your, your mile markers too? Or are you staying pretty close to schedule? And what are those markers? When does the uh, dress rehearsal finish? When does the Artemis one go up? And when is Artemis two planned for? Absolutely. So I think the most important thing that we have right now is our wet dress rehearsal. And essentially, after we complete that wet dress rehearsal, which is actually scheduled to happen here in the beginning of April, we will be able to set a specific time frame for our Artemis 1 launch, which as of right now, it's looking to be more like May or June. If everything goes well in wet dress rehearsal, which we're hoping for that it be the case, we should be able to get that rocket off the ground. And then a couple of years from now, we'll go ahead and have the Artemis 2 mission ready to roll. Because I think the incredible thing about all of this that people may not necessarily see is that to everybody's eyes, you know, Artemis 1 and Artemis 2 kind of look like the same mission, but there's a lot of ground support equipment that's being modified here at Kennedy Space Center to be able to support it, which is essentially why we have that delta between both of the missions to get everything ready, as well as get our crew ready to go on this amazing mission. So Abadel, in the, in the, in the wet dress rehearsal, where's that point or is there a point where you're going, oh, if we just get past this, we're cool? So I think there's a lot of different requirements that we have ready to go um, that we need to make sure that they're appropriately done. I would say that if we get through the appropriate countdown and we get it ready to rock and roll and get everything appropriately done, we should be good to go. But that being said, you know, even if we have some sort of a simulated scrub, which we actually do have that as part of the consideration, we're still hitting our marks and making sure that everything is ready and operating appropriately. So at the end of the day, it kind of goes down to our launch director um, which probably is like somewhere up there hearing me right now talking about this and kind of just saying, hey, we did everything that we could. Everything is good to go. We hit our marks. We completed our milestones. Let's get this rolling. Wait, how did you just turn to Eddie Vedder? What is Eddie Vedder doing up there? <laughs> <laughs> did you have a big concert to, uh, to like welcome this, this rollout? I guess so. You know, I think I've seen a video of this before and we have like a bunch of different music going on with it. And I think we had a couple of people that created different songs. I think Lindsey Sterling was one of them that went on top of the LCC, which is, again, the building that I'm on right now. And she like had a violin playing and everything. So, yeah, we got a couple of people in there, you know, creating songs for us. which is pretty cool. <laughs> hey, we got to solve the Armageddon debate here. Would it make more sense to send drillers up into space or astronauts up into space <laughs> if an asteroid was coming to destroy us? <laughs> So it's funny that you mentioned that, actually. So we recently had a mission that was sent out for NASA, and I believe it was START, if I remember correctly. And the purpose behind that is actually to essentially go up to a asteroid mm -hmm. and essentially attempt to do some sort of redirect for it. So I think from NASA's perspective, we're OK sending a satellite instead to take over rather than astronauts. But <laughs> quite frankly, I wouldn't mind going. That kind of sounds like a cool job to have, although if it goes bad, then maybe it won't be the best one to do. <laughs> that yeah. one went pretty bad in the movie, although, you know, it was it was Michael Bayified a little bit. Let's yeah, give back. Was. Let's give back a little bit here. We have about 30 seconds. If you've inspired the young, like you were inspired to yeah, join NASA, yeah, how do they get involved like you have? 
Absolutely. So I think the thing that I try to tell everybody is, you know, we encourage people to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and arts all the time. And that is very important to us here at NASA. You know, the majority of the people that are doing the work here have those sort of degrees. But the one thing that I really want to stress out is you don't necessarily have to have those degrees to be able to be a part of it. Meaning if you're doing business, if you're doing medicine, if you're doing biology, anything that's outside of the realm that you could think of that, you know, all of a sudden you're like thinking, well, only at NASA, I have to be an engineer. You don't. You can literally pretty much be doing anything that you can think of, sometimes not even necessarily have a degree, and you can be a part of the team that we're working here today. So my point is, you know, don't give up on your dreams, follow your dreams. And if you want to be working for NASA for the great things that we're doing, there are opportunities available at all times for literally everything that you can think of. Couldn't have said it better myself. A little cowbell for you, the team at NASA. Best of luck with the Artemis mission, the right dress on. rehearsal, and of Peace course, of Artemis luck. too. Take care, sir. Thanks for your time today. Thank you so much, guys. Go Artemis. <laughs> Go Artemis. Go, Go Artemis. To the moon, Artemis. To the moon. To the moon. All right. If you enjoyed this show, you can scratch it wherever you're podcast. We are live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Look up What the Truck. Down Freightways TV app. Download the uh, new Freightways app. You can even oh, talk yeah. to us in the chat room in there. Find me on Twitter, at Timothy Dooner. Find him at Vincent the Dude. Don't be a stranger and tell him how to be. Peace and love. Spread it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs>